I said, did they see you, Vinny? He said, no. I said, pay the bill and go out the side door. There's 200 people in there. No one's going to do nothing. And my father and Cleo had altercations before over Damien. Right. And that's what escalated. Going to be interviewing Robert Luisi today. Uh, he goes by Bobby, and um, it's a super interesting story. And uh, we're going to go ahead and start right now. All right. So one, I, I know you've started your own your own YouTube channel. Yes, I did. Yeah. Real quick, what's the name of the YouTube channel? It's Bobby Luis, the Bobby Luisi Show. It's okay. On YouTube. I also have a ministry show that I right. put up every Sunday. Uh, Robert Luisi Ministries. Okay. On YouTube. All right. And we, um, you know, we've already talked about this a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and reiterate the fact that, you know, what I know of your story is what I saw watching a Vlad interview. Yeah. Um, and, you know, initially, and I explained this also earlier when we spoke before being on uh, recording, is that, you know, I don't know a lot about, you know, the mafia and, you know, I, I know cursory kind of a, a an over I have an overview I've seen movies and I I know I actually was locked up with uh uh Joey Marlino oh that was my boss yeah right um yeah, and uh I was I was locked up with a, a several other guys that were a part of um Gotti's crew mm -hmm. and you know and for the life of me I can't remember any, any of their names but you know and I would talk to these guys and you know, a little here, a little there. Um, but other than that, I don't know a whole bunch. But what I found, and, and honestly, usually I would shy away from even associating with them because it, it is right. a violent lifestyle. And, you know, there's just a, a bunch of things about it that are that don't fit into my particular crime, you know, scams and cons and that sort of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. But watching your show or watching your um, story, as the story ended, you became more and more likable just because of kind of the, I don't want to, I don't know, not rebirth, but spiritual, I guess, rebirth that you kind of had that you kind of, um, you know, experienced. And, and it was actually prior to even be getting in trouble. Yeah. And, and so anyway, but as, as I, I watched, it was funny because you have such a better attitude and outlook than any of the other guys that I have, uh, have, you know, have been around, you know, a lot of them, they get into that, 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 you know, that gangster kind of, uh, mindset and they, they just can't seem to break it no matter what. And you seem like you pushed through it and you said, Hey, this just isn't, this isn't for me. This isn't, this is ridiculous. This is, this isn't working for me and it's not helping anybody. And, mm -hmm. but so anyway, I wanted to mention that up front so that once we get into the story, I don't, I, you know, forget about it. And I should have probably said it off camera, but whatever. So, um, and I did take notes by the way. Uh, and so I wanted to start with that. You know, you were, you were born and, you know, basically it's, it's, it's basically a mob, it's a mob story, obviously, but it's, right. you were, you were born, but you were, you, it seemed like you were just born into it. Like a lot of these guys. Yeah, I was, my father was, uh, I was born in 61. He was already with these guys on the street, uh, with the Petriaca family of Boston. I was born in the North End of Little Italy, and that was headquarters for the mob in the Boston area. Um, the boss of the family was in Rhode Island, a province hill that was Raymond Petriaca. But the Angelo family is actually ran Boston. He was uh, his underboss, Jerry Angelo, and his family. So those are the guys that I grew up around, all the Boston guys. And the couples and a lot of the soldiers were in the North End in East Boston, the two neighborhoods that I grew up in. So, I, you know, I was around the life. Even I think I was 11, 12 years old, I went and worked for a vending company that was owned by the Angelo family. And uh, their front man was Ronnie Romanowski, Ronnie Rome, and it was Rome Vending. And uh, I started that 11, 12 years old, going on all the social clubs, meeting everybody. Plus, I was Bobby Luisi's son, so I always got that little extra, you know. And it, it just started started early for me. Right. That's the life that I knew. And I'm, you know, I've I've interviewed guys, uh, a couple of police officers that were kind of raised in those same air, uh, you know, same areas, and 
you know, they were saying like, you know, you kind of, you became like a civil servant or you, you know, went into, you know, an organization. And that was, you know, those were like, those were the ways out of those neighborhoods. And that's what it sounds to me like from the we very had, beginning. You, were. you could be a construction worker, um, policeman, fireman, and a mob guy. You know, those are the things that made money for the people back then. Honestly, those were the good jobs, all the city jobs. So it was either do that or be in the mob. I really never wanted to be in the mob. You know, I tried legitimate business and I did well at certain times with it, but it was in my blood. You know, you grow up with these guys, you respect them, you look up to them. You know, that's a hard thing to shake. Right. I don't care who you are. You know, so, you're in that circle, you see things that are going on and, uh, you know, like I said, it's hot to shake. I wanted to let you guys know that I have a Patreon account. If you're interested in joining the Patreon account, it's got three tiers. The top tier, you actually get a different con man painting every single month. If you're already joined and you're already supporting me, I really appreciate that. If you haven't joined yet and you're interested in joining, I'm going to leave the contact information for Patreon in the description. Thank you very much for watching the video. So you you went to high school you graduated high school but eventually you ended up um you became you went into construction like you didn't really you were involved well, yeah. after i left the vending company i was 13 14 years old i used to go to work for a carpenter after school and he started teaching me and uh by the time i was 16 years old i was making like four five hundred a week with him and that was a lot of money in those days yeah back then uh, my family, the Luisi family, were all into construction, even my father at certain times. And, uh, you know, it was the family business besides the mall, you know. And um, I don't know. I just loved the carpentry work. I was 20 years old. I got my first builder's license. So after about 16, 17, I started going away from the mob guys and hanging around them. And I was going more to work. So at 16, I quit school. I got an apartment. And I was working full time. Did yeah. you feel like your 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 father was pushing you one way or the other, or was that not a factor? No, that wasn't a factor. Uh, you know, years later, I'm sure he wasn't that excited that he was on the street. You know, I don't think he really wanted that for me, to be honest with you. And so you started running. What kind of construction were you doing? Well, I was doing mostly um, uh, residential apartment buildings, you know, things like that. Um, 84, I went down to Vineyard, Martha's Vineyard. I built 50, 100 homes down there. I don't know the number, I don't remember. And, uh, but by the late eighties, uh, the market crashed down there. And I was sitting on spec homes down there and condos back home and, you know, everything fell apart on me. So I started losing my properties. I had 20 men working for me. And then before you know it, I didn't have a job for myself. Hmm. Came back to Boston with no money broke with two kids, hundred dollars in my pocket, and I went back on the street. That was the best, the fastest way for me to make money to support my family. When well, you say when you say going on the street, what it, what were you doing? Well, my family had, you know, my family was in the north then. We were a big family over there, and uh, you know, we had businesses there. My uncle had a bar room at the time. And there were kids selling drugs out of there. And instead of me stopping them, I started grabbing them and working with them. So I started selling drugs, very small amounts, just to get some extra money. Shook down a few people like we usually do. And uh, eventually I opened up a card club. We'd have card games two nights a week. Helping one in East Boston, one in the North End. Opened up a bookmaking office. And the drugs were really the big money. Right. Before you knew it, I was moving a half a key and then I was moving kilos. So it built up pretty fast for me. Cause you gotta remember, I was in business for years. So I had a business mind. Yeah. So I took them onto the street and I do, you know, I am an organizer, you know, it's obvious what I didn't put together. So it was kind of easy for me to look at it from that perspective and not really just being a gangster, but how are we going to make money here? And I put that knowledge into it. And before I know it, I became a millionaire. Right. You know, 
big loan shock business, big drug business. Right. I, I, I'm, it's funny because, you know, there are, there are, there are people that are workers and then there are people that are just leader organizers, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's, I, I always noticed that, you know, even friends of mine, you know, it's like, as soon as they get money, they spend it. And it's like, yeah, but right. don't you need to hold some of it for this or for that? Like I'm, I'm a saver. I'm a, you know, I always know that there's a rainy day and I need this to reinvest. And yeah, and well, a lot of people live for the day, not the future, yeah. you know that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. But, and then, then it's just adding zeros. Once you have something that works, it's like, well, mm -hmm. how can we scale this and make it bigger? Right. Um, so how long did, did that go on? Well, through the nineties, I got picked up, uh, June of 1999. So I had almost a 10 year run. Well, that's, it's not bad. So no, not for today's standard, you know, we're not back in the days with Carlo Gambino and the chin, you know, but, uh, Boston, as soon as I was out there, when my name got back out there, I had the FBI on me all the time. DEA, state police. So, you know, you're dodging and ducking these guys for years. Right. They'll finally, they get you, you know. So, I, I have a question. Um, yep. You were you were proposed to be a made guy in the, is it the Boston Mafia? In the family? No, it's the Patriarca family. It's right. the New England family. But and I was yeah. proposed. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. You, you're right. Proposed. You were proposed, but it didn't happen. No, I was proposed by a good friend of mine. He was becoming a cop in the family. And I had a really close relationship with him. I still have it today with him. And uh, But there was another cop in the family that I couldn't get along with. See, I don't know how they do it now, but years ago, your name went around. If someone opposed it and had a good reason, then you couldn't get made. And that wasn't only in Boston, that was in Philly, and that was in New York. The, so, the names were passed around years ago. So um, I had an argument with one of these couples that went a little too far. And uh, I knew that wasn't going to happen for me in that family. And at that time, I probably had one of the biggest crews. I was making the money, you know, and I wanted to protect what I had on the street. Right. Well, real quick, I, I have a, a question. So you're, you're basically, you can be a boss and you, you were a, you were a boss. You had a crew, yeah. but you're not ma a made man. What right. What is the difference between, I mean, like, what's the benefit to being a made member of the mob? Well, you know, that's a good question, really, because uh, everybody was oriented in the neighborhoods to be with the made guys, to be with the Patriarca family. So I had to overcome that. So every time I ran into a, a brick wall, who's with this guy, who's with that guy, and made guy and i wanted that to stop so what i had to do was get my button and start making my crew so now we're legitimately locos in austria and we're bosses up and i'm a boss up in boston so that's why i went and got made you gotta remember that turned into my life you know i was a diehard gangster i love because in austria the idea of it and i wanted to be part of that so going to uh, getting made uh, made me a boss up in Boston. Capo actually means boss, but I had a little more up there. I had the you know a strong crew up there. We were making all the money, and I was really starting to put everything back together. Because at that time, the Patriarca family was in disarray. In the '80s, I would have never been able to do what I did. I brought another family into a city, a major city. <clears throat> But through the war in the nineties and everything that went on, I was able to pull that off. And I became but things a had been Boston. the war basically had weakened their their hold and there was a there was room for another family. Is that what well what happened? You gotta remember the FBI. You know, they picked up a lot of people in the early nineties. The families in disarray trying to put itself back together. It wasn't as strong as it was in the eighties. Um and I just seen an opportunity to squeeze in there because I had a big crew. I had all the strength. Who's going to come up against me? If they could have came up against me, they would have came up against me. But they are, you, are you also, are you kicking up money to somebody like? No, not in Boston. Um, 
I did my own thing. I have, you know, it wasn't the Luisi family, uh, like is like the Gambino family, but the right. Luisi family up there, my family, because three of my cousins were made on my crew. And that's how we were running everything up there. You know, okay. but I had one boss that was Joey Merlino. And as a captain, I did send money down there. Absolutely. Well, that, that was what in, I was supposed to do for the family. Right. That was in Philadelphia. Right. Right. Okay. Um, I think you said Boston again. Uh, no, no, it was Philly. I'm sorry. With Joey. Right. Yeah, so I never paid anybody in Boston. Well, okay. So you said things were not, you know, things there were, there were issues. There was a, a there were a lot of, uh, there was infighting. There were a lot of issues in, in Boston. And, um, you know, you were, you were moving, uh, you know, kilos of cocaine. And at some point though, there was, I know there was like a, a dispute or there was an issue. And I know that your, your father and your brother and your cousin ended up getting into an altercation and they ended up getting kind of, you know, ambushed or gunned down. Yeah. They got gunned down in the 99 restaurant. How, how did that, like, what, what was the altercation that led that? And they obviously didn't think there was going to be a problem that you had said that they went there. They weren't even armed. They, they thought they were just no, going to squash no, the whole because, argument. You know, this was a neighborhood family thing. That's what it was. It was, so this wasn't even, department. this has nothing, this had, that had nothing to do with even really business. No, it wasn't. It, well, it kind of came from that, what uh, uh, the young Damien was doing on the street, Clemente. And Damien was with uh, little Vinny, who was with me. And uh, the way that it all came down, uh, I told them to stay out of the North End. They went to the 99 restaurant in Charlestown, thinking they'll stay out of the North End for the day till we straightened out a little beef that was going on. Who walks in there? My father and the crew. My brother, my cousins. The kids panicked. They called me on the phone. If you guys didn't know, I also do I do paintings, and uh, if you're interested in a painting, I'm going to leave my contact information in the description beneath the video. Back to the video. Because earlier they invited me for lunch, but I had a meeting. I couldn't go. And uh, Vinny Perez calls me on the phone and says, Bobby, your family just walked in. I said, did they see you, Vinny? He said, no. I said, pay the bill and go out the side door. There's 200 people in there. No one's going to do nothing. But while Vinny was calling me, Damien was calling his father. And my father and Cleo had altercations before over Damien. Right. And that's what escalated. Now, my brother Roman was there, too. Roman was a big, tough kid. He was a killer. You know, they were afraid of him. I think when Roman uh, made a comment, said something, stood up, I think Cleo panicked, and that's what started the shooting to be honest with you, because my father wanted him to sit at the table and talk with him and just get this straight. And my father had no intentions of hurting any of them. Right. To be honest with you. I can't say that about Roman, but I think my father wanted just to straighten it out with Cleo. Okay. Um, and so your father died, your brother and my your cousin, brother, my cousin, Anthony, Sonny Pelosi, who was like an uncle in the family. And my cousin, Ricky Saro, got shot. He survived. So we lost four people that day. Now that's a bad day. Um, yeah. uh, so, it, it, you know, it's, I I remember the, uh, well, when I was watching the, the Vlad uh, interview and, you know, you were, you know, you didn't seem, I guess Vlad was like, you know, like, you know, were you really upset and you were kind of like, you know, yeah, you know, I was upset. But but then again, you know, like you said, in that in that life, you know, you you're almost waiting for these things that happen. They're happening a lot. So Absolutely. I already had lost people at that time, you know, and, uh, you know, this is this is causing Austria. This is the mindset. Right. That you have to have if you can't think like that and overcome these things, you shouldn't be in the mob. Right. You know, like I said before, there was a callus over my heart, very self-centered, self-righteous, didn't care, narcissistic, didn't care about nobody but myself. I fed my kids and I loved uh, my wife at the time and my mother and father and siblings. But other than that, I could care less about anybody. I loved yeah. who I was supposed to love. That's how I felt, you know. And then if you cross me, I didn't care what happened to you, no matter who you were.
So, yeah, uh, I was a vile person at that time, violent. And, uh, you know, when I first got the phone call, I really felt something about it. But after 15 minutes, it was just back to business. Sad to say that, but that's what it was. You know? Yeah, I, I trust me. I'm. I mean, I, I in a in a in a different sort of way. I, I very much understand. You know, a lot of the things that you had said in that interview uh, struck me because, just in general, let's say running scams or doing anything. You talked about selling drugs or anything. You you have to be able to justify those things to yourself to to yeah. get through the day because you you can't yeah, allow yourself sure. to really think about what you're really doing or you wouldn't sleep at night. You mm -hmm. have to be callous. Yeah, you do. Um, if you're not, you're not going to make it. No, no. Well, then you should be selling insurance. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor. If you like the video, uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit the, the notification bell so you get notified of videos like this. Do me a favor and leave a comment. I try and respond to as many comments as possible. And uh, check out my Patreon and check out my Instagram and uh, TikTok. And uh, all the links are going to be in the description. And also, I appreciate you guys uh, checking me out. See ya.